7.30 p.m. right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Coming up on the program, surprise data from South Africa shows the economy grows by 0.4% in the first quarter of 2023. And Kenya's trade surplus with Africa hits record levels driven by fastest export growth in 12 years. Egypt's net international reserves increased by $109.2 million in May 2023. As a wet afternoon right here in Lagos, Nigeria, um, definitely a very wet one, but the markets are still trading um, right here on the African continent and on the NGX. We see the NGX is in positive territory um, right now, that intraday, 0.21%. Um, that's the print. I did uh, get a peek at uh, the markets earlier, and I see the oil and gas counter, that's shining with the Turner and uh, corn oil uh, pumping up the market right now, 55,924 points. South Africa, though, on the flip side, that's down 0.30%. Um, Other parts we, we track, North Africa is looking good with EGX um, up 1.11% and Kenya closing positive again, continuing that positive trend above the 100 uh, point level for the all share index there, uh, taking it up 0.94%. Other markets uh, we track in the Middle East, we see it's some um, negative sentiment there. Uh, with the UAE, it's uh, crisscross there, 0.14% for the Abu Dhabi index. It's up, but on the flip side, the Dubai index is, down, is um, up 0.80%, while the Abu Dhabi index is down. Let's see other parts in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia in the red, 0.14% at intraday. Qatari index, the biggest downer um, at intraday, 1.72% down. Let's head on to Europe now. We'll see, uh, once a year, Apple introduces its latest products, and for years, the developers' conference uh, hasn't been as highly anticipated as last night. Lars Holter uh, followed the event for Deutsche Welle. He uh, joins me now from Berlin. Um, great to have you, Lars. So did Apple live up to the high expectations? Hello, Lars. All right, we'll try and get, uh, we'll try and, okay. All right, I think we have Lars now. All right, Lars, did they live up to expectation? I guess they really did. With one product, they really hit the mark, and they saved it for last, too. First, there was talk of a new laptop, updates for the iPhone and the iPad, and then finally the Apple Vision Pro. And uh, what is it? It's a pair of mixed reality goggles. They look like oversized ski goggles, and they let users work with augmented reality as well as virtual reality, hence the term mixed reality. The glasses bring content right into the user's view. Apple chief Tim Cook says it's essentially an entirely, I quote, a new kind of computer that allows for a seamless experience of the real and the digital. And he also says that this would be one of those uh, products that will shift the way we look at technology and the role it plays in our lives. Apple has certainly had these kind of products before, the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad. Those were all game changers, all disruptive in their categories. But here with the goggles, there is at least one problem, and that would be that only the most well-off can even experience this uh, new mixed reality, because the Vision Pro is set to cost $3,500 and is likely out of reach for most regular techies. Quite expensive there, but where does this newest product put Apple amongst its comp uh, competitors? Well, it shows who Apple's main competition really is. It's Meta, the company, of course, that is uh, behind Facebook. Meta has its own set of goggles on the market. Just last week, it introduced the Quest 3 for just around $500, uh, by the way, so a lot cheaper than Apple's product here. 
It's a format of a third set of goggles, uh, and uh, the company has not had much success so far with uh, that whole product line. And that's partially due to the fact that the content isn't there. Remember, Facebook changed its name to Meta two years ago in an effort to focus on the metaverse as its number one priority, and that was a big bet on virtual reality and it hasn't paid off. Meta has lost a lot of money on the shift. Just recently it fired thousands of people and it remains to be seen whether Apple is doing any better here because after all, hardware is just one thing. Software and content is an entirely different one. And what works on the internet and the app store doesn't necessarily translate into virtual reality. Also, uh, by the way, it'll be interesting to see what Apple's launch means for Meta. If uh, Vision Pro is successful, it could either destroy the market for Meta or it could maybe even help the company, be, uh, company uh, by making mixed reality a much bigger thing than it is right now. Fantastic. Well, who is watching this event closer, tech and gadget fans or market investors? Well, I'd say for gadget freaks, the developers conference and the reveal of the Vision Pro must have felt a little bit like Christmas and Easter all in one. But investors are looking at this very closely too, mostly because it is so absolutely unclear how this will play out in the long run. I remember personally Apple when it first brought out the iPod, not too many people believed in the company anymore at this time and uh, shares were at the time in the single digits, but Apple managed to disrupt markets with an entirely new way of listening to music and it later disrupted other categories. As I mentioned before, it came out with a revolutionary phone that took the world by storm and now investors are wondering whether the Vision Pro is another great disruptive project or maybe a money pit. We might not know until years from now. Initially, markets reacted carefully to Apple's announcements and shares traded a bit down. All right, thank you so much there. That was Lars Halter giving us the details there. We did see uh, Apple stocks uh, did swing um, yesterday. Uh, right. The U.S. Uh, markets there swung from a high uh, down to a low, taking the market down yesterday. Let's head on to Asia Pacific um, now. Let's see what's happening there. We see Asia Pacific uh, tra uh, stocks are trading uh, mixed, to find moves on Wall Street after the S&P uh, 500 raised earlier gains that brought the benchmark index uh, to trade at its highest level uh, intraday uh, basis in nine months. Australia's S&P um, ASX 200 there, um, not doing so badly after the rate hike we saw there. Nikkei, uh, it's up 0.90%. The Shanghai Composite, that's down 1.15%. And we see the HSI uh, index, 19,099 points, down 0.05%. Um, in Japan, the Nikkei 225 continues to rise uh, above that 32,000 mark, gaining uh, a lot there. We see other markets there, Kospi, 0.54%. Uh, the last time uh, the Nikkei traded at these levels, Japan was in the middle of its bubble economy period from 1986 to 1991, where real estate prices and stock prices were hugely inflated. We see the Nikkei reached its all-time high of just above 38,900 in December 1989. Moving on to the U.S. Now, see stock futures uh, were near flat uh, today as Wall Street uh, digested a recent rally that led the S&P 500 to its highest level in nine months. Futures tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average there was seeds down 0.87%. Big drop, yeah, for the um, in the S&P 500 that's down 0.11%. But the Nasdaq Composite that's down um, lesser than other um, parts. The market's coming off a down session. Uh, with the S&P 500 falling 0.2% after touching its highest level uh, since August. The, the Dow and the Nasdaq Composite um, also fell. We'll see Apple there uh, contributed to the leg down. The iPhone maker briefly touched all-time highs earlier in the session, only to end about 0.8% lower. The big tech, which swung between a 2.2% gain and a 1.6% uh, loss on Monday debuted its highest anticipated, highly anticipated virtual reality headset, as well as new software at its annual worldwide, uh, worldwide developer conference. Uh, was on Monday, we see shares were down by 0.4% after hours.
prices uh, edged lower today, giving up most of the prior session's gains. Uh, the followed announcement by the world's top exporter, Saudi Arabia, uh, that would further cut output. See, Brent crude futures is down 23 cents, by 0.3 percent at $76.48 a barrel, while the U.S. WTI crude debt eased 25 cents by 0.4 percent to $71.90 a barrel. See, um, right there, there's a lot of volatility in the oil markets. Uh, Brent had gained as much as $2.60 per barrel on Monday, and WTI as much as $3 after Saudi Arabia, the world's top exporter, said at the weekend uh, its output would drop by 1 million barrels per day. Uh, to 9 million barrels per day in July. The benchmarks uh, pulled back, though, um, to more modest gains uh, by the end of the day. And to the metals market now, see gold prices traded in narrow range uh, today as investors sought more clarity around the U.S. Federal Reserve's policy outlook. Uh, but lower Treasury yields kept a floor under the non-yielding bullion. Uh, fell, the spot gold fell by 0.1% to $1,960 per ounce, while U.S. gold futures uh, rose by 0.2% to $1,977.20. Um, traders now see a 78% chance that the Fed will hold interest rates at its June 13th and 14th uh, policy meeting According to CME Group's uh, Fed Watch tool, a change from the 10 straight um, rate increases. A benchmark 10 year Treasury yield slipped, proving the opportunity cost of holding gold, which yields no interest. The dollar index was steady. It held uh, close to the two month high from May 31st. A stronger dollar makes the bullion less expensive for investors holding other currencies. Welcome back to watching Business Incorporated live on Channel Self as well. The BRICS uh, foreign ministers meeting ended in Cape Town with eight new members joining the body's new development bank. Uh, these include the United Arab Emirates, Bangladesh and Uruguay, South Africa's Minister of International Relations and Corporations, uh, Naladi Panda, uh, who addressed the media, says that the BRICS new development bank is playing a key role in advancing the developmental agenda of developing nations. Our South Africa respondent, Innocent Samosa, reports. The new BRICS Development Bank has grown its membership from five to eight members, and A9 is set to join soon. Host Minister Naledi Pando of South Africa said the bank has recorded impressive progress and that most of the loans secured through the bank had been for infrastructure development. She also announced that members are happy about the bank's AA+, Plus, with a stable outlook rating by Standard & Poor's. In our view, the bank has uh, recorded some really quite impressive progress. We're particularly thrilled that it's maintained uh, its very, very excellent uh, financial rating. It also has played a role, which was our aspiration when we created it, in providing support for development programs in our own countries, but in the member countries as well. We had hoped we create a dif different kind of development financial institution that really would be committed to addressing matters of socio-economic development. BRICS countries accounts for over 40% of the world's population, 20% of the world trade, and 25% of the global GDP. The BROC is attracting a lot more interest. However, with Russia-Ukraine conflict, economists predict Russia's economy will contract between 8 and 16% this year, wiping out all the gains of decades of economic growth. Russia is currently facing challenges as it experiences restrictions from the SWIFT payment system. While MasterCard and Visa are impending cross-border payments, this situation raises concerns about its potential impact on the country's overall success. 
Ambassador at Large, Asia and BRICS, Professor Anil Suklal, is advocating for the integration of cut payment systems among the BRICS countries. Uh, this came out very clearly in the message of uh, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, who have indicated that we, we must develop alternate systems uh, to, to the established systems, and that's happening. Uh, to give us uh, greater autonomy and not be held hostage uh, by certain entities in terms of global financial uh, uh, payment systems and settlements. Ministers expressed their desire to establish their own financial messaging systems instead of relying on the Belgian-based SWIFT network. Professor Anil Suklal suggested some sort of a BRICS rating agency in order to provide an alternative credit rating system. Look, this has been on the agenda of uh, BRICS meeting uh, in the past. It's come up again, and that's something also that I think will receive attention as we go forward, that uh, we are not only dependent on, on rating agencies that are based in the north that determine uh, our credit rating. Uh, we should have also our own rating agencies looking at this. This was actually discussed when South Africa had the chairship in 2018, and this was something that South Africa had put on the discussion table. It's still very much on the discussion table. The final suggestion here was to use the national currencies of BRICS nations for trade. From Cape Town, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channel Television News. And still in South Africa, the economy grew by 0.4% in the first quarter of the year. That's according to Statistics South Africa attributed the economic rebound to improved manufacturing output and uh, the finance ministry on the figure came out and higher than expected. It's believed that economic growth could have gone uh, further north if not for the electric uh, power crisis, which is dragging the economy. Respondents spoke to the statistician general, uh, Rasenga Maluleke, who summarized the picture. Take a listen. The economy of South Africa grew by 0.4% in the first quarter of 2023. And indeed, such a growth was driven largely by a manufacturing that contributed 0.2 of a percentage point to this 0.4% that we see, whereas it grew at 1.5%. And we also see that uh, uh, in the area of finance, real estate, and business services, it contributed 0.2 percentage points while it grew at 0.6 percent. Now, what are the areas uh, in terms of manufacturing that uh, uh, contributed the most? There was a strong show in the manufacturing of uh, food and beverages, whereas in the terms of finance, there was a strong show in uh, uh, financial intermediation, insurance, uh, business services, as well as uh, other areas. But uh, now we have seen that um, um, agriculture went down by 12.3 percent and of course contributed in the negative. But going further, let us look at um, um, expenditure on the GDP, particularly household expenditure. It um, uh, showed a strong uh, growth, particularly from the side of restaurants and hotels, which contributed a lot more stronger and indeed uh, grew uh, in the positive. And to the commodities market now, since the purported removal of subsidy on PMS, most uh, fuel-related refined products have witnessed a spike in price. But the price of cooking gas, um, LPG, has moved in the opposite direction, actually declining by 25.87% uh, to 6,950 naira for a 12 uh, kilogram uh, gas cylinder in June. Let's talk to Adeye, uh, Debussy now, analyst, financial derivatives company. Great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. So what is responsible for this contrarian price movement with cooking gas? So is, first, you have to know that there are, there, are a few, there are a few determinants of cooking gas prices in Nigeria, uh, which are global energy prices, the exchange rate pass through effects, and the load and demand and supply, since um, cooking gas prices were not subsidized before. So since, since the advent of the Russia Ukraine war in 2022, where we saw energy prices spiked to multi-year highs, see oil prices go over $100 per barrel, natural gas prices over $99. You know, we saw a consequent rise in cooking gas prices in Nigeria, because um, in some cases, um, cooking gas prices were for a 12.5 kg cylinder, 
so far as much as 13,000 Naira in certain states. But since its peak in 2022, there has, and there has been a sharp decline in energy prices, and which again has, which again you've seen a direct effect in cooking gas prices, which is now at 6,950 Naira in June. Also, as I said, the exchange rate has a part to play in the down price movement. Um, in May, Naira depreciated to as well as 738 Naira per dollar and has appreciated in June as well, which has also contributed to it. And also, it's since, since the removal of subsidy, higher petrol prices, you know, which has squeezed consumers' disposable income, which has now reduced demand for natural gas, leading to excess supply in the economy. And with the basic laws of demand and supply, lower demand, higher supply, which would lead to lower prices. This, these are some of the reasons why cooking gas prices have seen a decline. All right. I, I do hope my gas supplier actually gets this memo and <laughs> the prices actually reflect. But I don't. Nigeria derives a lot of dividends from its investment in um, the NLNG. Um, according to Economist Intelligence, um, you know, the global price of liquefied natural gas has declined about 43.86% uh, to about $2.24 uh, per MMBTU from um, $3.99 in January. Uh, does this mean that the, this drop in price and uh, profitability will um, impact the returns of Nigeria's investment in NLNG? Firstly, Nigeria owns, through the NFPC, owns a 49% stake in, the, in NLNG, NLNG Limited, and it derives its main source of revenue, as you said, through dividends and substantial tax payments. Reports show that uh, from 2015 to 2021, Nigeria earned about $5.84 billion in dividend payments. And yes, of course, in declining global energy prices, and depreciating equipment at the facilities, profitability of the company will be affected. But however, the, the company is still expected to remain viable in the long run. So yes, of course, lower LNG prices will affect, will lead to lower dividend from the company as profitability reduces. But however, it's expected to be only a short-term phenomenon, but it's not, and it's not have any dramatic effect on Nigeria's um, fiscal sustainability or stability in the long run. Um, yes. So the community is expected to remain viable and profitable in the long run. All right. Thank you so much, Ade. Ade was the analyst uh, financial derivatives company. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, let's move on to other stories. Now, we see Kenya's uh, goods trade surplus with Africa uh, reached uh, record levels in the first three months of the year, driven by fastest growth in exports for 12 years and the first fall in expenditure and imports uh, in three years. According to provisional data collated by the Central Bank of Kenya, traders sold goods worth 98.85 billion shillings uh, to African countries in the January to March um, 2023 period against an import bill of 61.72 billion shillings. This resulted in a merchandise trade surplus of 37.14 billion shillings uh, for the review period. as a 156% climb over the same period last year. And Egypt's uh, net international reserves increased uh, by $109.2 million during May 2023. Reserves reached $34.66 billion in May, up from $34.55 billion in April. Over the past uh, nine months, Egypt's NIRS have been ticking upward after being hit hard by the Ukraine war last year reached a low point of $33.14 billion um, dollars in August 2022 after declining from a high of $40.9 billion um, dollars in February 2022. The IMF is currently reviewing Egypt's economic situation to disburse the second tranche of a $3 billion loan approved in December 2022. The country's net foreign assets deficit uh, increased by uh, 51.456 billion Egyptian pounds to 755.688 uh, Egyptian pounds in March 2023, compared to 704.23 billion Egyptian pounds in February. And global airline regulator IATA says about $812 million of the $2.27 billion owed to airlines is trapped in Nigeria. It's an industry essential to driving economic activity and job creation. IATA's regional vice president for Africa and Middle East, Camille Aladwadi, calls for engagement with the government on the matter to avoid an industry collapse. Mr. Wadi was a guest on Business Morning earlier today. 
Africa. Our hope is that that uh, we can engage with the government, uh, come up come up with a solution that is that is comfortable for both parties, um, and and start are paying off the backlog of $812 million, okay? Um, it, it can't remain as is, and it should not get worse than it is right now. Uh, we, we need to engage and find a permanent solution for this. Um, you, you mentioned that FX is an issue for Nigeria. Um, does, that does not mean that Nigeria doesn't have FX. They, they do have hard currency. Um, it's just the priority that, that that the government needs to do and calculate where these prior uh, where these FX are going, and it's simply uh, remanagement of this foreign exchange. I I think if nothing is done, most of the airlines will pull out uh, from Nigeria, and and immediately will people will say, oh, that's good for the Nigerian uh, airlines because then they can operate on you know, with no competition. But at the same time, that but once the, all the airlines pull out of Nigeria, they'll prevent the Nigerian airlines from operating too, which means that that effectively the aviation industry will collapse. And that's the show today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.